your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we ask um, for your Holy Spirit to be here. We ask, Lord, um, for, well, first I ask that you would forgive my sins and uh, speak uh, through me tonight and just send your Holy Spirit to, to live in each one of us, speak to our hearts, and Lord, we're just going to be talking about some important topics, and we just really ask that you would um, bring the Holy Spirit here. Bless each person here, and in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to turn to Luke 18. While you're doing that, I'm going to do the announcements. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. Um, tonight's entitled, The Method to Our Madness. Um, so the announcements are that this Sabbath we have City of Refuge starting December 4 at 4 p.m. Invite whoever you want to. Um, I, the flyers weren't printed in time, so we'll have some maybe by Sabbath. We'll have something for you to hand out to people if you want to invite somebody. Um, tonight we're going to be kind of getting ready for what City of Refuge is trying to do as a group. We hope all of you will come. All of you are invited to come and we want to lay the groundwork and we're going to go ahead and, and talk more about this on Sabbath. Uh, but we're going to get started talking about the City of Refuge on Sabbath. Brian and I are in the throws of arch in archaeology in the Old Testament class. So my final paper is actually on the city of refuge in Shechem. So score, I get to kill two birds with one stone, do a talk, and write a paper. But this week I just finished um, my class for um, Life and Teachings of Jesus at uh, Southern, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Christ and how he approached people. So, um, you know, let's read Luke 18, 9 to 14. I have a lot of notes here I'm going to be referring to. So, um, if someone will read that, Luke 18, 9 to 14. Nelson, would you read that? He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed this with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, uh, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the tax collector Standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So a study that came out of London University that I was uh, looking at uh, this week they, they did, took a survey of the students at the university and they found some large, like 98% of the students, faculty, um, Christian or non-Christian, all felt that they were moral, morally superior than other people. Um, it's a human condition to feel morally superior. That's, that's we, we tend to think of ourselves as we, right. It, it, it's a way that we, we operate, we believe from our mindset that we are right. And then in that same study, they were talking about dopamine hits, that when we find out we're right about something, there actually is, you get a hit of dopamine in your brain. So you, it just gets reinforced. We love to be right. And pro, you know, in Proverbs it says there's a way that is right to a man, but the end is sure destruction. And um, I don't know about you, but I've done this, sadly. 
uh, tonight I was going to talk about the investigative judgment because it fits in with the sanctuary service, but God took that talk away and gave me this talk to speak on because I'm mainly preaching, you know, talking it to myself. Um, but I don't know if you have ever lost something and immediately when you can't find it, you start thinking of all the people who might have taken it or messed with it, or maybe your husband t picked it up and moved it somewhere, and what did you do? And I'll even yell at the kids, well, you know, where did you put this? And then all the while, either I'm wearing it, it's on me, or <laughs> it's somewhere I put it myself, right? So um, this condition of humanity to believe that we are right is very, it's, it's the way we, we're hardwired as human beings to have this sin nature and want to be right. So the parable of the two worshipers is one of those daring parables that Jesus told. It's one of those parables that got him in trouble. Think about that. It, it did. It get, got him in trouble. Parables like this are, what cruci are why the Pharisees hated him so much. Um, what is this parable doing? Well, as we look at this parable, this is what we're going to analyze. We will discover that this parable brings out before us three very sharp contrasts. So you have one thing and another thing that's totally the opposite. The first sharp contrast is between the two men who came to pray. You have a Pharisee and you have a tax collector. And remember, they were both members of the same church. So this, is talking about, this parable is talking about believers, um, believers in even the same church. Uh, they both worshiped the same God, but there was a sharp contrast between those two. The second thing that we notice is a sharp contrast between the two prayers that they offered. And finally, we have a sharp contrast between the answers they received from God, and I'm so grateful for that contrast. We'll look at it at the end. So let's look at each one of these. First of all, the contrast between the two men that's found in verse 10. Two men went up to, to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So what is a Pharisee? The word Pharisee is sometimes given a very negative definition in our day, uh, but the word Pharisee really means the separated ones. Um, in Hebrew. What did the separated ones mean? From what were they separated? Were these Pharisees separated? Well, over the years, the rabbis of the Jewish religion had added rule after rule to the laws and instructions given by Moses so that by the time of Christ, we had actually tens of thousands of rules of do's and don'ts. And some of them were major, some of them minor, uh, for example, you remember one day the Pharisees accused Jesus' disciples of eating food without washing their hands or accused them of, uh, it's, it's really ridiculous, but by going like this and gathering the wheat, he, they, the disciples would have broken three Jewish laws because he, they, they harvested and they threshed and they, just by going like that and rubbing it in their hands, was a sort of threshing of the wheat in, in the Pharisees' mind. This is how... Um, the word minutia comes, you know, that's the tradition of the Pharisees, the very minutia, the letter of the law. Um, this had become, a, these do's and don'ts had become a requirement for salvation and all kinds of rules for the Pharisees. And if you were to obey all those rules, if you were to follow those blueprints, that's a very important word for this study, the blueprint made by these rabbis, it would take you a full-time job. And I know of documentaries that I've seen, and when I went to Israel, um, let me tell you, walking through to the, the, to the wailing wall where you wash your hands, um, the men just don't even look at anyone. I mean, their nose is just, the, the ortho, Orthodox Jews' nose is really high in the air, and you could just feel the generations of pride. And some of these uh, religious people that are really into the Jewish Orthodox faith are actually on a sort of welfare because all they do, all the husbands do, um, is read the Torah and, and their scriptures and memorize their scriptures and follow their law. And it's a full-time job for these men. What a burden. What a burden. You can't even go and get a job 
because the burden of keeping all the laws, all the, all the thousands of do's and don'ts, is a full-time job. They wouldn't have time to have a job. They, they're keeping the law. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So it, the Pharisees separated themselves to do this very thing. They were very meticulous. They were very zealous about obeying those rules, the do's and don'ts. Because of this, they refused to mingle with the other believers whom they looked down upon because they were not obeying all the rules. If they were living to, today, they would be the... Holy Joes, they would be the church member that we think is just, man, that person has got it all together. That person is, you know, like you just couldn't imagine that this person isn't tithing or, you know, make messes up during the week or says a bad word or they're just the person that you hold way up here and esteem way up here because they come off as extremely um, holy. Um, or somebody that you, I mean, like I just said, you, they belonged to the holiness club. They were the ones who followed the blueprint to every detail. There was, and, and, and might I say, there is nothing wrong with that. Um, it was the attitude of the Pharisees that was the problem and, and the endless rules that they had added because they had added rules. They had taken the law of Moses. They had taken the Levitical law. And then they had added a bunch of traditional laws on top of those laws. So if they had just stayed to what God wanted them to do, you would have had a very healthy, thriving society. As we see, like in the, when the Black Plague broke out, broke out in Great Britain, um, it was the Orthodox Jews who were not getting sick from the plague because they were practicing Levitical laws of cleanliness. And so they didn't get sick like everybody else did. And so these laws are not, in fact, bad of themselves. It was the, tr the traditions of man that were thrown on top of that. And not only that, it was the motivation. And this is what ca Christ called, um, called out for. It was the attitude of the Pharisees that was the problem. And what was the problem? And, and this was the Pharisee. So his motivations are what Jesus is calling into question. So what about the publican? We have one man, and then we have another man. He was the tax gatherer. He was what we would call, in today's, in today's language, the IRS. And, um, you know, Brian and I have had knocks on the door from the IRS years ago when we were really struggling financially, and Brian and I had gotten behind on our taxes, and they sent someone out to talk to us, and Brian just appealed and said, look, we're really struggling. And they gave us, you know, some help and thank the Lord we got current on our taxes. So, um, and that was by the grace of God that that happened. That was a miracle. I won't go into that story, but um, very few of us like the IRS people. <laughs> but may I make it clear that tax collecting in the days of Christ was very different from the IRS collecting our taxes today because they did not have a fixed rule for collecting taxes. Rome divided her country that she was dominating into provinces, and then each province was subdivided into areas, and in each area they were allowed to make bids, like contractors put in their bid uh, to build a house. Um, so these uh, Jews put in their bid to be the tax collector of this subdivision as to how much tax they would collect for the Roman government. So each one gave their bid, and the highest bidder, of course, Rome would normally get the, would, Rome would say this person gets the job of collecting taxes for that area. So the Roman government did not set a fixed amount of taxes on her people. It's the tax collector who gave his bid, and he was required within a year to collect that amount of taxes that he had signed the contract with Rome for. So, I mean, they were really burdened too because here they go and they sign this contract with Rome that they're gonna get this much money out of their, out of their own people. So it's the tax collector then who gave his bid and he was required within a year and any money he collected above that amount was his. Now, he never told the people how much he bid the Roman government for, 
So they never knew how much he owed the Roman government. But he would tell them that that was what he was charging them. That was what the Romans were requiring as tax. So very often he would keep a big chunk of that because he would, uh, he would charge a very high tax that he could make a lot of money if it was a dishonest tax collector. Now, if you had an honest tax collector, he would charge the people the amount that, he, you know, just be honest. But the whole system was just set up for dishonesty. I mean, you've got people putting in bids to Rome. And so normally these tax collectors were quite rich people, but here is their problem. Number one, they were Jews collecting tax for the Romans, and therefore they were despised by the Jews. So they're hated because they're traitors to their own people. These tax collectors were looked upon in the same way. They were considered extortioners, exploiters. They were looked down upon as traitors to God and to their own people. But more than this, they, looked upon, they were looked upon as sinners who could not be saved. So you've got the publicans. These are the people psh, you've given up on. They cannot be saved. The Jewish priests and the religious leaders looked upon the publicans and gave them no hope for salvation. They had reached the point of no return. I was, tonight I was going to talk about the investigative ju judgment and how we as Adventists have the most beautiful belief that we do not burn in hell eternally, that it is a God at the end, the, the judgment, there's a, there's a judgment before God, and when we, we will all be called to stand before God and be judged. And I have stood before many judges when I was running from the law and when I had a warrant out for my arrest and got arrested and just the whole long story of drug dealing and craziness. But I finally had to stand before a judge one day for my crimes. And I, I literally shaking in your boots, just shaking in your shoes because that man has the power to put you in jail. And he said, he, he said if I see you again in my courtroom, uh, you're going to jail. So uh, that man has the power to take away your freedom. And when we stand before God and we're to be judged, we, I'm sure I'll shake in my boots for a split second until you see Christ steps forward and he stands there next to you and he defends you to the judge who's his father and it's all and he's your brother, is your brother and your lawyer and your advocate is standing there talking to his father and defending you. It's the most beautiful, I mean, there's so many beautiful things we have as Adventists that, I mean, all our doctrines can be found just in the book of John alone. But this message that Christ our righteousness, I mean, he just throws his arm around you when you go to speak to say, you know, these are, my, these are your sins. You, to have that arm around you and have Christ stand next to you and say, defend you. And it's not your record anymore that gets talked about. It's his record that gets talked about. It's so encouraging. Um, so, but this is, God wanted me to talk about this today because, you know, this is preparation for the kind of people that we want to come to core. We want a lot of different people to come to core. We want people who, if they need to step outside and go smoke a cigarette or whatever else, you know, you can't tell anymore these days because of the vape pens, but, you know, if they need to do that, I'm not looking. I'm not, I'm not judging them because people need to hear the gospel. If that means that they come in dr dressed inappropriately with piercings and that's fine with me. Come on in. Let me put my armor. Let me do to you what Christ has done to me. Because I know that I've offended Christ more than anyone else. So, like Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. So we're looking to put our arms, plant the seeds in your hearts, and we know that you guys all have the desire for the same things that we do as believers because we know time is short. We see it. We see it in the news. We can feel it. We talk to other people, people at the grocery store, the people who are checking you out. They say something's wrong. 
uh, something's happening in our day to day, uh, get a haircut and lady cutting the hair is saying, you know, something's wrong. I can feel it. Something is happening. People need to know, but they need that love, that, that arm around them that's not going to see what's going on. And I mean, yes, there comes a time to, to rebuke, but when people are coming to Jesus, we got to let them come to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit start doing work. So here are the two individuals who come to church. One is very religious and has a very high opinion of himself. The other one recognizes that he is a downright sinner and comes to God, placing himself in the hands of his loving Savior. Then we go to the contrast of the prayers. So Luke 18, 11 to 12, listen to the Pharisee praying. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. And um, in Jewish culture, it was uh, totally normal to stand up and pray. In fact, D Daniel, probably before his window, when he got stood up to pray, he likely, um, his window, when the princes were going to kill him, if he didn't stop praying, he was likely standing. It was, it was normally acceptable to stand before God. And, and um, so when you hear of the Pharisee standing up and the publican does the same thing, this is not unusual. It's quite common for Pharisees, for the believers of Christ to stand up praying. Um, in fact, they, they didn't close their eyes either, traditionally. They looked up into heaven, they raised their hands, and they talked to God. Um, I've done that before, crying out to God, and uh, many of you know our house almost burnt down, and um, the flames were 15 feet from our house and over 60 feet high, and, you know, at that point, you're just, you run out, you get the kids out of the house, and you just throw my arms up to heaven and just start you screaming, you know, in the name of Jesus, deliver us, deliver us, you know, and the fire went the opposite way. We didn't even get smoke damage that day, and we had a lot. We had the helicopters dumping on us. I mean, it was quite the, the story and quite the miracle, but, you know, you put your hands up and you cry out to God. That's a whole nother message, but yeah, yeah, that's that story. I love telling people that story because there's the power of crying out. So this Pharisee was praying not to God, but telling God about himself. He said to God, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men or women, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Um, extortioners, I already said, unjust, adulterers, uh, or even as this publican at the back of the church here, wretched sinner that he is. I fast twice a week. Remember the Old Testament required fast, uh, the Old Testament, when we learned, um, when uh, Kristen was teaching that fasting was only required, you know, once a year on the Day of Atonement. But by the time of Christ, these rabbis had added so many traditions that they were fasting twice a week. You weren't a real good believer in God if you didn't fast twice a week. And this fa Pharisee was fasting twice a week. He was very particular about paying his tithe on everything he possessed. I mean, man, this guy's going to prayer meeting. He, he's, he's the church, one of the church elders probably. He's just, he's got it all together and he's the person that you would go to if you had a problem because he's, he's the man in church. But in Luke 18, in contrast, we have the publican standing far away. How many people do you know that are stand, standing far away from church? Because they don't feel good enough they, to come to Christ. He was afraid to come and mix with the worshipers. He didn't feel that he was one of them. Uh, you know, what about our kids? Uh, there are kids that don't feel that they're one of us here. And it's painful. We want them to know that they are one of us. We don't look down on them. We want them to come and join us. He felt that they were good people, but he was a, he felt that other people were good people, but that he was a wretched sinner and he struck his breast and he doesn't even look up into heaven and he says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's pause a moment and look at these two men praying. First of all, uh, turn to Psalms 24. 
because I believe that when the Pharisees were praying, both men probably had these two verses in mind. Psalms 24, 3 to 4. Judy, can you read Psalms 24, 3 to 4? Who shall, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully? So the question being asked in Psalms 24 is, who is the right to come before the Lord? And the Pharisee may have said to himself, that is me. I've never exploited anybody, even though in the temple they were overcharging um, for offering. The, the Pharisee may have had this in mind. He had a tremendous eye for himself. He had a terrible eye for his fellow believer. He was a man who could present himself before God and say, God, I thank you I'm not a sinner like this man behind me. The publican was the very opposite. We do not know how old this publican was, but obviously he was not a young person. He had been a tax collector for a long time. We don't know how long he was tax collecting, but he was exploiting his people for a while. There's a text that the chief priests and the scribes were using all the time to beat these tax collectors up with. And they, they, they were putting on them the guilt trips of all guilt trips all the time, probably every time they came to church. And maybe even Zacchaeus had this text in mind when he was redeemed by Christ. But the text is found in Leviticus 6, 2 to 5. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read it to you. But if you want to write it down, it's Leviticus, Leviticus 6, 2 to 5. It was the favorite text of the Pharisees to use against the publicans. I don't know if you've ever had anybody say to you, well, Mrs. White says, uh, or um, say, well, the Bible says to condemn you, but it, it's, it makes you feel about that tall. Um, and these tax collectors were, this verse, Leviticus 6, 2 to 5, was used to beat them up. It's if anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving his neighbor about something entrusted to him or left in his care or stolen or if he cheats him or if he finds lost property and lies about it or if he swears falsely or if he commits any such sin that people may do when he thus sins and becomes guilty he must return what he has stolen or taken by extortion or what he was or what was entrusted to him or the lost property he found, and kept, of course, for himself, or whatever it was he swore falsely about. He must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the owner on the day he presents his guilt offering in the temple. In other words, the law of Moses says that if you had been exploiting people, if you had been stealing it is your duty when you are found guilty to return back and even give them an interest of one-fifth because that's what verse 5 says. You have to pay interest. Remember when Zacchaeus... Yeah, scary, huh? Zacchaeus... Yes. So remember when Zacchaeus found Christ and Christ accepted him even though he was a sinner? That, what did Zacchaeus say? And Luke 19.8 is what Zacchaeus says to Christ. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Well, Zacchaeus could do this, but the publican in this prayer obviously could not do it. He was full of guilt because he had cheated people and he didn't have whatever it took to pay everybody back. I don't know if you've been in that situation before, but when you've been a drug addict like me um, and you've stolen and you've pawned things and you've wronged people, um, there's just not enough money that you can pay everybody back. So, you know, you, I had to knock on my friend's door and, and apologize for you know, sleeping with her baby daddy. And, 
she was very angry with me, but God called me when I was a Christian to go knock on doors. Every person that I had offended while I was living that lifestyle, I had to knock on doors and tell a group of Hispanic gangbangers in a house that I, I've never put a hit on your cousin, and please tell him he's free to come back to the area, won't harm him. Will you forgive me for my anger? And they would not open the door for me. They would only speak to me through a little, a little crack in the door um, because of the anger, the, the reputation that I had gained in the town of being this angry, awful person. So I had to go around and I'd knock on doors and, and apologize to these people and make things right as best as God was convicting me to do to live at peace with all men as far as possible, like what Paul says. But there are some things that you just, if you don't know a person's name, there are people I've searched for, that I'm still searching for, that I, if I ever, you know, I pray and I say, Lord, bring those people into my path again so that I can apologize to them because I don't know where they are. And this is that um, publican. He has no way of repaying. So I'm going to tell you a story. One day there was a missionary pastor whom I got this story from. He was holding a workers' meeting among the pastors out in Africa, and one of them suddenly got turned by the gospel, and he realized that there was still hope for him. And he came to the pastor, and he himself was a pastor. He said, you know, pastor, I've been a minister for 30 years. I'm about to retire, and the tragedy is that I have no hope of salvation. You hear a minister say that, and he said, the pastor is saying to the other pastor, why? He said, well, I've been doing something for 30 years that I have told nobody about, not even my wife, and I do not know what to do about it. And the missionary pastor said, what's the problem? He said, for 30 years I've been keeping some of the tithe and putting it into my own pocket. You see out there they didn't have banks in the country, so the pastors have five, six, eight, ten to fifteen churches normally going around collecting the tithes of the churches, and they're the ones who bring it to the conference or to the field. And he said, I felt that I was under and this is a quote, I felt that I was underpaid, and I read the text in the Bible which said that the workman is worthy of his labor. He was rationalizing. We all do a lot of rationalizing. I felt it was all right if I kept some, but now, after 30 years, I'm feeling guilty. There is no way I can pay it back. Even if they were to deduct my salary, the total amount for the next 10 years, I could never pay back what I have stolen. Is there hope for me, he said. The missionary pastor turned to this parable that we're reading tonight, and he said, look, that publican felt the same way. He had exploited people, and he felt that he had no right to come to the church, so he stands in the back, and he says, Lord, I am a sinner. And it's my prayer that people like that will come here. And there's no way I can cleanse my guilt. I am in your hands. I am at your disposal. He says, God, forgive me, a sinner. He may have tried to restore all he could, but he could never pay back all that he had done. He comes to God as a sinner, putting his hope in a loving, merciful God. This parable says that this publican never claimed to fast twice. He never claimed to pay tithe. He simply came to God, and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man rather than the other, went home justified before God. Just let that sink into you. This man has not done anything good in his life. And he's, because he's saying, Lord, he can't even look up to heaven, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Christ says, today, I, that man is justified. Did Christ condone sin? No. But Christ knew that man cannot save himself. 
So which do group do you and I belong to? That's what I was thinking about this week. All of us are sinners. I think we can all agree with that because we know what the Bible says, that we're all sinners. But somehow we have got the idea that we are not all the same kind of sinners, and I'm speaking of myself just as much. It's nor it is the human condition to put levels of different sins that somehow I could be a better person than you because my level of sin is different. The reason for that is because the Bible defines sin in two ways. Sin is an act, and as far as the sinful acts are concerned, we may not be very guilty of any sinful acts uh, that like somebody else might commit. I don't have, I, I've committed a lot of sinful acts in my life, so, um, but sin is also what we are by nature, and by nature, we all stand on the same platform. So when somebody walks in who is, uh, who is just, you think that person's high as a kite, they're coming in, or a person is proud and lifted up and they've caused all kinds of heartache to you, we remember we stand on the same platform as everybody else by nature, regardless of what they believe. Because we're all by nature sinners. We are 100% sinful. Paul says in Romans 7, 18, that there is nothing in me, nothing good. I know that nothing good lives in me, says Paul. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Has anyone else here felt like that? I know I feel like that all the time. Does feel like today I'm going to do something good for my kids, with my kids, and then I'm... I'm tired now, <laughs> I'm worn out, so I cannot carry it out. <laughs> but the fact that you and I have not committed gross sins does not mean that you and I are better than any other person. But here was this Pharisee who was very meticulous about following the blueprint. Remember, the blueprint in his mind was following carefully the law of God, and he followed it to the very detail. But in his own eyes, he thought that he was a better man than others. He looked down upon the publican. So we need to look at the answer, the third contrast. Here was a Pharisee who read his Bible. He prayed four times daily because the Pharisees, uh, the Pharisees would pray at 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock, according to the uh, Hebrew tradition, the Pharisees, that's their tradition. He fasted twice a week. He paid tithe. He was very faithful in tithe paying. And these are all amazing things. So I don't want you to think that these aren't just, I mean, I want my life to look like that. In fact, Jesus said that these you ought to have done. But what was wrong with his performance? He was depending on that performance for his acceptance before God. So if there's any part of you that's doing your Bible study or praying your prayers out of an obligation, you, you might as well not do it. We need to pray and come to God in Bible study because, and I've got, let me tell you, when you have homework, that is your Bible, and they give you a test on your Bible, Oh, I had to pray, oh, Lord, please don't let me have a distaste for your word because I'm being tested on it, you know, how many questions, and uh, oh. And I, we have to pray that God will give us love for his word and will bring us to his word with the right attitude. He... Uh, so the third, the third contrast is he was depending on the performance for his acceptance before God. And that is where he went wrong. He was not looking at his performance as the fruits of the gospel. Our performance are the fruits because we love God. Some of us might need to start over again with our falling in love with God. It's not unusual in Revelation Jesus says, turn back to your first love. And I've had to pray that prayer, Lord, return me to my first love. Because you see people, when they first come to Jesus and come to the gospel, they're all excited, 
And there, are, there have been some times in my life where I have been irritated by those people because I wish I was like them. Because I wish that I could go back because I remember what it was like when I first became a Christian. How excited I was. I was ready to go and feed the homeless and preach on the streets, pass out books, and I was doing all these things. And, and I, I, I was shocked by the, the irritation I received at church. When I came to church, and I was, we should be doing more. And they're just, you know, because they're on burnout. And so, you know, I can understand both sides, but we need to pray that God will give us a new love. And these fruits of the gospel will come out naturally. He was looking at his performance as that which could qualify him for heaven. He was telling God, God, look what a good Christian, what a good believer I am. He reminds me of those who will stand in the judgment seat in Matthew 7 and say to God, I prophesied in your name, I've done all these wonderful things in your name. And Christ does, what does he say? Oh, that, that verse gives me the chills. Is that the one that said, Lord, Lord, Jesus? Yes, Lord, Lord. Mm-hmm. That verse gives me chills. This publican looked at himself as chief of sinners. In 1 Timothy 1.15, we read these words. Here, and Paul's writing these words, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. So full acceptance. So there's no doubt in your mind. 100% acceptance. Full and complete. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the worst. (laughs) That's the... That's the attitude I'm talking about. That's the attitude I'm talking about. If, if people come in here and we all, they say, you don't know what I've done. And we're just like Nelson, I don't know. I think I might have you beat. But remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said, the sick are the ones who need a physician. The ones that are healthy do not need a physician. And then he concludes, I have come not to save the righteous, but to save the sinners. That is why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins by those words, Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is not talking about money poor. This is talking about in your heart. Feeling, if you've ever had that feeling that you're not ready for Jesus to come back yet, because you're not ready yet, Remember, it's a, you would not feel that way unless the Holy Spirit was drawing close to you and you were seeing yourself in the light of a perfect Savior. Because what does the Spirit do? Convicts. In contrast to this, I would like you to look at a group of people that the true witness rebukes. Let's turn to Revelation 3. And we're ravenous, so you're going to know, here are a group of people. You know who they are. This is the message to the Laodicean church. So Revelation 3, 17. And what do these people say about themselves in verse 17? Can somebody shout that out? Um, Abby, Revelation 3, 17, shout it out. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and you peace of good. So we say to ourselves, I thank you, God, that I am rich and increased with goods. I thank you, God, that I don't need anything. I keep the Sabbath. I pay tithe. But yet I do not know that I am wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And what do I do to solve this problem? Um, If you have a copy of Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen White, I wish that you would read this chapter on the two worshipers. Um, It's Christ's Object Lessons, page 150 to 163. 
That's Christ's Object Lessons, page 150 to 163, because it is dealing with this parable. And I want you to what's, uh, notice what in this chapter is brought out, because you may look at yourself and you may say, I am not self-righteous. I, I can, I, I've said that to myself. I'm not self-righteous. I used to be a meth addict. How could I be self-righteous? Um, well, I know plenty of drug addicts who are very self-righteous. I know plenty of homeless people who are very self-righteous. You don't have to be, self-righteousness is not a poor or a rich problem. It's an everyone human problem. The sin of self-righteous is a very subtle one. You know what Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? But here is a clue that will help us to understand whether we are suffering from the sin of self-righteousness that may be so deep down and even our subconscious that we may not be aware of it. Ellen White says, whoever trusts in himself that he is righteous will despise others. That's the method right there to our madness. The method of knowing whether we are suffering with self-righteousness overall is that we will despise others. We will not have a love for others. So how do you look at others who are not following the blueprint? Remember, the Pharisee is following the blueprint to the T. Every T, T is crossed and I is dotted and he is the Christian man. He's, the, he's our modern day elder of the church. And he's following the blueprint. So what do you do when you see a lady walk in who may be all decked up and she's wearing things she shouldn't be wearing? And you may say, I wonder why she's, oh man, does she really have to dress like that? She doesn't belong here. And there's just it's all things going on in your head. She may belong here more than we do. And as the Pharisee judges this uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 151, goes on to say, as the Pharisee judges himself by other men, so he judges other men by himself. The Pharisee makes his righteousness the measuring stick of righteousness. And when he compares his righteousness with the other people, what does he do? He gives them the idea that he is a very fine Christian, but there is only one measuring stick of righteousness and that's Jesus Christ. And when you and I stand before Jesus Christ, the more we recognize His righteousness, the more sinful we're going to feel. That's why salvation is never a feeling. You never get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is a good day, I haven't done this or that or this or that, or this is going to be a good day today because I'm not going to do this and this and this and this and this. Or you may go to bed and say, oh, I didn't do that. And then the next day you might do it and just totally beat yourself up or you said something you shouldn't have said to somebody and you caused a problem or you hurt someone's feelings. And the thing is, is the more, sin, the more fully we understand how good God is, the more sick we feel. But who came to heal those that are sick? Jesus did. There is no way that we could ever reach the righteousness of Christ. We will grow day by day. We will grow day by day and become people. We will look back and say, wow, God has made some changes, but we are never going to go, good on me. It's good on God. In word, in action, Jesus is perfect. And when we compare our righteousness with each other, then we have the tendency to look down, which is another method, is if we're comparing ourselves to other people, then we are having, we're struggling with self-righteousness. Do you look at other people and think they ha they're doing so much better than you at this? Man, they Bible study like nobody's business. I wish I knew scripture like that. And I mean, I, there's a natural, we admire people, but to compare ourselves by ourselves is dangerous because there's only one 
person who is righteous, and that is God. And it always makes me afraid when I see somebody get up in church and they say, our church is a good church. Our church is a great church. Our church is wonderful. Because I'm thinking in my head, no, you're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're not. We're not good. Because I know what I am. And I know, <laughs> there, I heard a saying this week that if you look around your group and there's no crazy person, you're probably it. And the thing is, is when I look around the church, I know if I'm there, then something's got to be wrong with that church. <laughs> so, you know, I got another story uh, from, a, uh, from another pastor. Several years ago, the General Conference received a letter from a very fine, um, godly Christian. And uh, when the communists took over in uh, China, the missionaries who were running the show for the denomination had to leave. They could not stay there. They had to come back to America, and the church fell into the hands of the nationals. These nationals had to go underground. And you know what? We're coming to a time in Earth's history where churches are going to have to go underground. Uh, Conrad Vine, who I suggest you look up on YouTube and listen to some of his sermons, uh, V-I-N-E, Conrad Vine, listen to his sermons because he talks about um, you know, we are losing our freedoms quickly. And all that, the, <laughs> all, the, all that the government has to do, the Adventist church, is to put a stop, um, put a seize the bank, as bank accounts. And that's it. Man, our churches would go down. And so we're getting to a place in Earth's history where we're not far from having underground churches and underground meetings. But this was happening in China uh, for many years and a while back, and they had to try and keep the church alive under tremendous pressure and persecution. And one of them was a graduate of Pacific Union College, and the MV leader of the China division was a national. So he could not run away like the other missionaries did. The miss other missionaries got to leave and come back to America, uh, but he was Chinese. So they put him in prison for several years, tortured him, mistreated him, gave him a hard time, but he remained faithful. He was one of the few who remained faithful. He was of a few. That word just gives me chills again. About 15 years after he was in prison, he wrote a letter. He had become friendly with the jailer, and the jailer had promised him to post this letter. This pastor giving this story happened to read, the pastor who gave me this story happened to read this letter from that Chinese Adventist in a Chinese prison some years ago. A very interesting letter with many pages. And in this letter, he said, brethren, we made a great mistake in our work in China. And he gave about 15 points. And in one of the areas, he said, the trouble is that the missionaries looked upon the Chinese who said yes, yes, and who followed the blueprint and who follow, looked very holy as the pillars of the church. But I want you to know that these are the ones who turned against the church. These are the ones who denied Christ it's the ones who you had no confidence in at all, the ones who were looked down upon as sinners in the church, who are the ones who are rallying together and holding up your church in spite of persecution. It's so easy to judge people by the outward appearance, but we don't know what people are going through. I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. We don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. The moment you and I feel that, the moment I feel that I'm better than you, the moment I cherish a thought that we are better than each other, we belong to the Pharisees. And how do we know when we are being self-righteous and looking down on others? So here's the methods of finding out. We've already gone over some. We may look at someone else and say, yes, this is what he needs or what she needs. This is what they should do. 
because you, they should be doing this and they should be doing that. And each one of us must examine ourselves. We must ask ourselves whether we look down upon our fellow believers. They may not be following the blueprint. They may not be living up to the standards. But I'll tell you, you do not know what is going on in their hearts and minds. They may be struggling. They may be seeking God. They may be like this publican saying, Lord, I don't have a right even to come to church. Can you please forgive me? There is no way I can make up for all the damage I have done, for all the money that I have stolen. But look at the second half of the second quotation by Ellen White. You can't look at it. You don't have Christ Object Lessons, but I hope you look it up when you get home. The prayer of the publican was heard because it showed dependence reaching forth to lay hold upon omnipotence. Self to the publican appeared nothing but shame. Thus it must be seen by all who seek God. By faith. And what is faith? Faith that renounces all self-trust. Remember, Peter was not a converted man until after he saw Christ on the cross and completely after he denied Jesus and cursed his God. And he began to not trust himself. That's when he was a converted man. Faith is renouncing self to trust, and the needy suppliant is to lay hold upon infinite power. No outward performance can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. Please don't substitute your performance for the righteousness of Christ. Christ's righteousness, what he'll wrap around you at the judgment, is the only cloak that will stand before the judgment seat of God. And all we need to do, what Ellen White says in page 159, I love her statement, we can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. The only thing we can say is, yes, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. She uses the word consent. That is all we are able to do as human beings. We are, we consent. And that causes the Holy Spirit and Christ to live inside of us. And then we go forward with the armor of God. I look at one Pharisee in the Bible who was exactly like this Pharisee in this parable. Turn to Philippians 3. Look at this Pharisee. But thank God. God, this is a converted Pharisee. There were many Pharisees converted after the death of Christ. After the cross of Christ, many Pharisees came to Christ. They were in that crowd at Pentecost when Peter was preaching. And let me tell you, Simon, who as an uncle sexually abused his niece, Mary Magdalene. There's, I love the fact that Ellen White references that and says Simon was Mary Magdalene's uncle and had caused her to fall into sin. But you know what? Because of Jesus, both Mary Magdalene and Simon in the same church, because Jesus heals all and brings forgiveness to the worst family situations you can imagine. Philippians 3.3, 3, uh, Paul says this, for it is we, that is we Christians, who are the circumcision, which means we are the ones who are truly circumcised. We who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The Jews boasted, the Pharisees boasted that because they were physically circumcised, they were a child of God. But Paul says, no, the physical circumcision does not make me righteous. We all are the true circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, which means from the heart. We worship God from the heart and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, I suppose if somebody read this text to Peter and John after Stephen was just stoned, and said, this is the statement made by the man responsible for Stephen's stoning. 
they would have said impossible, absolutely impossible. But in Philippians 3, verses 4 to 6, the Apostle Paul describes what he was like before his conversion. Notice it's very much like the Pharisee in Luke 18. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. If anyone attained to the self-righteousness, that is what it means, righteousness of the flesh, it was I. And I'll give you the facts, he says. Number one, I was circumcised the eighth day. Number two, I'm not a mixture. I'm a pure-blooded Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and touching the law, I'm a Pharisee. I've been among those who were meticulous about every one of those rules. And concerning zeal, zeal for God, I persecuted the church. Remember, Paul did not persecute the church because he thought he was doing wrong. He thought he was serving God. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Can you imagine him praying? God, I thank you. I'm not like those miserable Christians. I'm a good fellow. Because I can. But there's a but there. Whatever was to my profit, uh, and I, I don't know if this is the only time where poop is mentioned in the Bible, but I'm very glad. I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And by that, he means self-righteousness. I consider them rubbish, literally dung, that I may gain Christ. Now look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. This man who talks about what he was as a Pharisee by the end of his life, do you know what he calls himself? The chief of sinners. But remember, God used him mightily. As long as we have trust in ourselves, God can't use us. Look at Peter. He had tremendous confidence in himself. He brought a sword to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was ready for things to go down. I don't know if you've ever had a weapon and you've been ready for things to go down or you've gone in, into a fight and you were ready for things to go down, but he had that adrenaline. He was ready for war and he said, oh Jesus, I can guarantee you that while all these other disciples were, will forsake you, I will not. I will raise this sword and I will die for you. And he was right. He was, he was being honest. And when they came for Jesus, he chopped off an ear. And he, when you chop off an ear, you're not aiming for an ear, you're aiming for the head. He was willing to kill for Jesus. And did he die for Christ? No, he denied him three times, and not just normal denying. The way in, in, in oh, I wish I had the scriptural reference. I'll get it for you. But when you deny God three times, there's supposed to be no hope. It's blasphemy. He committed blasphemy. So there was no hope for him. He ran out of the courtyard thinking there was no hope for me. And Jesus said, Peter, when you are converted, then I can use you to feed my flock. I want to close now with how Jesus ends the parable. So we can go back to Luke 18, 14. And please apply this to yourself, just like I'm going to apply it to myself. Luke 18, 14. For everyone who exalts himself. 18, 14, I'm sorry. Luke 18, verse 14. The last part. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. 
I was listening to a man uh, today talk about humility in a way that I'd never heard before. Um, he was talking about humility and that it's something he just really enjoys. Uh, apologizing and recognizing that, remember I started off with 98% uh, of us, of students at London University think that they're morally superior to other people. We enjoy being right. We get that dopamine uh, uh, hit from being right. But we're not right. Christ is right. And we need to be willing to sacrifice our opinions and the way we would have things done to reach others in the way that Christ would have us reach out. This is not the only time Christ made this statement. If you go a few pages back to Luke 14, where Jesus talks about the parable of the wedding feast, one man comes to the feast and sits right in front, and the other man sits at the back, and when the host comes, he says to the man in front, uh-uh, what are you doing in front? You don't belong in the front. Go back. And to the man in the back, he says, you belong here in the front. That's Luke 14, 11. And Jesus makes the very same statement. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. One of the hardest things for God to do to us is to humble his people. Humility can be a very different, difficult thing, but it doesn't have to be. It really doesn't have to be. It can be enjoyable. That is why throughout the lives of his saints, he uses methods. If you read 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says that God allowed him to have a thorn in the flesh, lest he be exalted above measure. If you read the life of Ellen G. White, she was told by the angel that God would strike her with sickness to keep her humble. And I can tell you, as someone with a chronic illness, I'm grateful for my illness. Because if I didn't have this illness that causes me to be sick all the time and catch every cold, I would be off fighting every crusade that I found and I would not be taking care of my family or reaching the hearts of my children because I just love a good cause and I would have all this energy to go follow them. And my illness keeps me in the Lord. And so there are times where I'm very grateful for it. Others ask me tomorrow and I'll feel differently probably, but I want to close with 1 Corinthians 10, 11. So these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So Paul is talking here about the history of the Jewish nation in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. He's talking about the history of the Jewish nation. And Paul is saying that the history of the Jewish nation has been recorded for our use upon whom the ends of the world is come. I don't know if you ever heard Alden Ho. Well, you guys, Alden Ho came to Emmanuel Church and he talked about the fifth generation. Time is short. And that, we, the fulfillment of the ages, that, that is us. And Paul is saying here that the history of the Jewish nation has been recorded for our use upon whom the ends of the world is come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. We must apply that both individually as a person and corporately as a church denomination. My prayer, our prayer should be the closing part of the quotation on page 159 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is the prayer that we pray. Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. She's talking about the fact that we cannot deny self in our own power. That means that I, I ha I'm going to be self-righteous. Uh, I need Christ living in me. And I don't have any power on my own to, to do good things. So then she goes on, it is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. And the whole purpose of that flowing through my soul 
so it can flow through to others. If all of us would have the attitude of the publican, we would no longer point our fingers at each other, condemn each other. We wouldn't do that. And why? Because all of us would recognize that we are 100% sinful and saved by grace at the foot of the cross. We are all that publican. But when people begin pointing fingers, whether politically, whatever your whatever ideas are, I try not to talk politics with people because I want to love them with Jesus first. But when people begin pointing fingers and saying that your theology is wrong and you're wrong and that church over there is wrong, they, they don't believe in the Sabbath without careful examination of self, as long as we do that, we will have two kinds of worshipers in the Adventist church. I heard one minister recently say, a friend of mine, that unless we have spent time in prayer, ready to lay our lives down for a person, we are not ready to rebuke them. Because rebuke's got to happen sometimes. Ask the Holy Spirit to talk through you nicely and kindly. But until I'm ready to die for that woman, until I have entered into prayer on my knees or standing up for that woman, and I'm ready to die for her, and I see myself standing on the same platform as her, as a sinner, I am not to rebuke that woman. If I can't do it, like if I can't lay down my life for that woman, I shouldn't say anything. But it is my prayer that we will all move to the platform of the publican. We will recognize that we are 100% sinners saved by grace alone. So that when we see others go wrong, we will have the attitude And I want these words to sink in because they're some of the best words that, sadly, it it could make me a a serial killer amongst you. It could make me a a thief. It could make me uh, who, you know, it could make me whatever in front of you right now. But John Wesley said these words, and he said, There go I, but for the grace of God which means that if it wasn't for the grace of God, if I wasn't raised in the family I was raised in with the blessings that I had and the, the, the opportunities that I had and the way God sh- shaped my life, I might be in prison. If God hadn't saved me in that court that day or has saved me in the back of the police car and he took me to a different lockup than in another lockup that was more dangerous, I might be your I, I might be a killer. Who knows what I could be? Who knows what you could be? So when we see someone on the street, there go I. But but for the grace of God, there go I. I could be just like them if God has not given me the opportunities and the love and the grace. And He can do it for them too. We will try to help these people and help each other instead of condemning them and come together and we will all grow as people, as Christians, but we won't notice it. It's my prayer that this group, that that CORE, School of the Prophets that's going to be continuing, Emmanuel, all these different, even the Adventist church in town, It is my prayer that all these groups and these churches will be filled with publicans who can go home justified. So let's have prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we lift up our hands to you. God, have mercy on us. We are sinners. In Jesus' name, amen.